On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Mora is five foot, seven inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Mora's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family at moramurrayfamilydirect at gmail.com or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Mora Murray. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. I'm Tim here today with Lance being joined remotely. Lance, how are you today? I'm hanging in there. How are you today, Tim? I'm doing well. Lance, this is part two of our episodes on Erica Franilich, and these are pretty hard-hitting episodes. Part two probably being a bit more eyebrow-raising than part one. Yeah, well, the conversation that we had with Greg and Lou, and Greg and Lou are from Brianna Maitland's case. They were employed by Bruce Maitland, who founded Private Investigations for the Missing. They are doing this case pro bono. It's to showcase what PIs for the Missing can do. And the longer this conversation went, the more we realized that this is information that's never been heard before, and it was uh, more and more revealing the more they spoke. That's right. And we really, again, need everyone to share. And please go back and listen to part one. And please give it a retweet if you saw it on Twitter or give it a like on Facebook or share or something. Uh, We could use some help in rocking the boat for missing Erica Franilich. And again, she's been missing since October 13th, 1986 from Middleburg, New York. She was 26 years old at the time, a Caucasian female, brown hair, brown eyes, Her two upper front teeth protruded, and she has a mole on her left knee. She was last seen wearing a baggy shirt and blue denim overalls. And Franilich was a mother of two and living with her husband at the time of her disappearance. If you have any information, please call the New York State Police at 518-630-1700. And for more information on private investigations for the missing, you can go to investigationsforthemissing.org. We get back into it pretty abruptly here. We start talking about the investigation, and then we quickly start talking about Ricky Jr., Erica and Richard's son. The investigation's going, been going on for a while, and uh, this pretty dogged investigator gets involved in uh, 2000. I think it was in 2003. Things heat up quite a bit. What I don't think that they realize, or what, or what he realizes, is that Quite a few members of his family actually spoke to investigators and not in a kind way. Oh. Yeah. The statements that the the PIs gathered, I mean, I can't speak for the police, but the statements that the PIs gathered are not kind. His, his family believes that he was involved. Um, and it goes further than that. You know, conversations were revealed, and one of the, one of the brothers actually cooperated and if you're, you're to believe these PIs, he cooperated with the police. Wow. Can you go into that a little bit more? Um, not really. <laughs> he, he, he cooperated quite a bit. And that's, I, I think, that something that's going to be pivotal when the time comes. But being established up there, I mean, they've been up there for years now, obviously. This case is, what, 33 years old or whatever. Eric and Richard's son, Ricky Jr., Got himself into some trouble. Lou, do you remember what that was about? Ricky got into trouble in high school. Yeah, he he got into a fight with um, another kid and beat him up pretty good. 
uh, he wound up actually serving time for that. He was sent to, um, I think he got three months or so in the correctional facility up there for, for this assault and battery on this uh, fellow student. So when he, when he was kind of bouncing it, he went in and out of jail a couple of times. Erica's sister actually ended up going to visit him in jail. He had never met her before. And they had quite a conversation, and then they corresponded from there on out. And more than anything, I think he just wanted to know his mother's family and things like that. And he was pretty excited and wanted to go out and spend time out in Michigan and stuff like that. And, and he really enjoyed coming to New York and stuff. But what what the family doesn't know, I mean, the, the Franlicks don't realize, is that Ricky talked quite extensively and quite openly about what was going on and that he believed his father had something to do with with his mother's demise. We have the letters. We have it in writing. Uh, he talks about that. He also talks about the fact that if he finds out that his father was involved, he's not sure what he'll do. Reading the letters, it's just you can you can feel this kid's turmoil. I mean, it's it's bad. But he honestly, is, you read his letters, and he he really wants to do the right thing. But one of the ongoing problems he has is that he says, I. I don't know what to do. I, more and more, I think that my father had something to do with my mother's disappearance. It's eating him alive. And he, and he says, I don't know what I'll do. He has some, you can tell he has some anger problems and stuff like that. Obviously, he beat a kid almost to death. But you can tell he's a good kid, but you can tell he's a troubled kid. But one of the things he says is that uh, my father's girlfriend is, is, is haunting me. She's... She wants to throw me in back in jail, and I have to walk in eggshells around her. I'm afraid I'm going to go back to jail. He actually becomes homeless on, on his own just because he's afraid. He, he just goes and sleeps in vehicles, and it's not good weather when he does it either. But, but he goes on to, to make some comments, and again, I, I wouldn't say this if I didn't have it in writing, but his father, Richard, has a girlfriend who he's had for many, many years. Obviously, they're not married. He's still married to Erica. But uh, one of the things in the letters that he says is that... Uh, the girlfriend's abusive to him in that uh, at one point she had said to him with Richard in, in company, why don't you tell your son what you did to his mother? One of the things he says is about the girlfriend is he said that she would tell me, I'm going to read from the letter here. She would tell me, and I'll skip her name, that my mom wasn't well mentally, that she had problems and was mixed up in some hard drugs along with dad. And maybe she couldn't take it and she had to get away. He says, I don't believe any of that. It sounds like speculation, far from the truth. She also told me that amnesia ran in my mom's family. <laughs> Is that possible, Lou? Amnesia run in your family? Uh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot the question. <laughs> uh, I'm finding out more and more lately. Seems all a bit strange to me, especially after she said something to Dad about her telling me what really happened to my mom, how he killed her. There's something they're both hiding. I'm going to find out what it is eventually. Erica's sister actually went to Ricky's funeral when he committed suicide. Um, so the story is that he was found hanging out beyond their property. Um, Richard and someone else, I can't remember who, found him. But when Erica's sister, Nada, was at the funeral, a young girl approached her and said, um, you know, he did this because you told him that you told him that his father had something to do with killing Erica. And she said, okay, that's not true. Why don't you come sit down for a minute? She said, I sat down with the girl, and she said, I never said that. I never talked to him about it. Why don't you ask his father's girlfriend? Because she's the one that said it to her. And so the girl just looked at me with her mouth open like, what? So we have information firsthand from Ricky in his handwriting. What was going on? Quite a few letters. So this is stuff that, you know, they just can't dispute. We have statements you know, from his family that were given behind his back. We know that one of the family members was co cooperating with investigators to a degree. To a degree, he got this, this, he got afraid. He got worried. The brother that lives up there was in some sort of trouble at the time, which I haven't been able to put my finger on. But he ended up showing up at the funeral in handcuffs. The police brought him there. I think they've all been incarcerated at one point or another, right, Lou? Yeah, I think so. Wow. So just to clarify here so richard's son ricky committed suicide after he uh wrote these letters about believing his dad may have been involved in in uh, his mom's disappearance 
Yeah, you know, he's speculating. He's, he, he thinks something's up, you know, and the, the, the girlfriend is, the father's girlfriend is making innuendos to him about it. And, it, you know, and he, he's a troubled kid, but th this, is, this is the one thing that he obsesses over. When you read these letters, you can tell he's just obsessing over his mother, who he never knew. You know, he had like one or two pictures of her, and that's it, that we know of. Jeez. And, you know, when he, when he started talking with Nada, he just, you know, fell in love, and he wanted to know more about a family. He wanted to move out there and visit her. And he enjoyed going down to the property here in New York. He, uh, he talks about that, too, spending time there and stuff. Which, I, you think about it, if he loved going down there and spending time on that property, which is the family homestead and stuff like that. If the rumors are true, which, you, you know, we don't know. If the rumors are true and she's on that property... He literally enjoyed going to a property where his mother is secreted away. That's demented. He didn't. He didn't know anything about the investigation. He knew what he had heard. So no, you know, he didn't. He didn't know anything about there was a possibility that he was on that property. He just heard stories that his father may have. It was a suspicion. Yeah. It's a suspicion that he had and grew and grew according to his his letters. That property uh, in Dellington actually has. A cemetery on it, which again you'd have to ask Lou this, but I don't think that's something you can do at these days. Maybe that's something that was grandfathered in, but there's actually a family plot on the on the property. And of course, so that's you know you hear a lot of the same rumors when you look at these cases. Look at Brianna's case, where you hear "fed to the pigs, run through a wood chipper," right, Lou? There's like a dozen of them in there. Every time somebody dies and they can't find a body, it's a story. Yeah. yeah. And, and the one we heard recently was uh, put into a grave because no one would look. First of all, it would be a legal issue to go look into a grave. And if a dog ever hit on it or anything like that, well, of course, it's a grave. There's, that's why there's a body in there. But that was, of course, a rumor that came up that she was in one of the graves. And there's always a lot of rumors. Now, you said that you had the opportunity to speak with Richard. How did that go down? And what did you walk away from with that? I spoke to him briefly on the phone, which, you know, I don't, I like to speak in person, but the distance involved and things like that. So, you know, he claims that, uh, again, Eric, he dropped her off at a, at the, uh, bus stop. He told me a different time frame than the one that's recorded in the statement. Of course, because it's a lie, he can't, he's not going to keep it straight after all these years. He's angry about it. He's angry that people are investigating it. I said, we're just trying to find Erica. And then it's, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, when you when you start hitting them with the facts, and I said, listen, you, you, you know, your family believes you did this. You know, your, your family. Again, I mean, I don't know if he did it or he didn't had anything to do with his life's disappearance, but his family seems to think so. Um, you know, they won't say that to his face. But when they talk to investigators over the years, they make those statements. They you know, they, that's what they tell investigators, that they believe he had something to do with it. So, yeah, I don't know. He, he ended up hanging up on me. <laughs> what, why? What did, uh, how did the conversation go? Well, I just, you know, at the end, I just said, you know, you do, you do understand that you're, what your family's saying. And then he said, oh, come on. And he hung up. But, you know, I wanted, I told him I wanted to give him the opportunity to tell me what happened or whatever. I don't know what to say about that other than, you know, when you ask him, well, just, you know, tell me what happened. And he immediately lies. I dropped her off at the bus station. Well, he didn't. And then he doesn't get the time frame right. <laughs> no. Yeah, so he just was incorrect on his previous lie, or he was trying to correct his story? No, he's just he doesn't know what the lie is anymore, I don't think. It's it's bullshit. And how old is he now? Oh, well, he's going to be 60 now, I would think. Uh, yeah, he was born in 1960. He's 60 years old. Oh, okay, so he's, okay, he's 60 years old now. Uh, what's his life like? Uh, I have two questions. Was his family aware of the, the extent of drug use that went on between uh, himself and, and Erica? And is he still in and out of trouble? Or is he still, you know, in some sort of volatile relationship? Lou, how did the people that uh, we spoke to describe <laughs> him and the brothers? Well, I, I would just say that the fact that they were, that Richard was in and out of trouble was more the norm in the family than the exception. Yeah. Have a very um, violent reputation, I guess, in the area. One of the things that he said in my conversation with him was, I've never been violent. I've never been violent. Well, we had documented, we know for a fact, <clears throat> when they were traveling, he beat her to the point where she went into the hospital and she had a, a broken clavicle and she had uh, she lost a baby. So Richard 
Richard abused Erica to the point where she lost the baby and broke her, her collarbone? Yeah. We actually have a statement from the girl that drove her to the hospital. So I, I don't know what the mind frame is, is to lie to me when I know this for a fact. <laughs> it's, not, it's not something I'm not going to find out. You know, you ask enough questions and you pound on enough doors and you, you're you going to find these things out. I, I, how, why would he lie to me about that? We know it happened. We, we're positive it happened. It's, it's, not, it's undeniable. The girl drove her. She came to her friend's house and she's in rough shape. And she drove her to the hospital and she knew, obviously knew what her, she was her friend. She went in with the emergency room with her. She knew what happened to her, how badly she was hurt. Were there charges pressed? No, I don't think she did. She had a broken collarbone. Did you say that to Richard when you interviewed him? Yeah. Why are you lying to me when you know I can find out information on my own? Yeah, I said, I know this for a fact. What did he say? He said, no, it's bullshit. And, and, then what, and then what did you say? I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around your, uh, your process. When you know you're being lied to and then he backs it up with another lie, do you just say like, well, I guess we're going to agree to disagree? <laughs> you know, I don't. It's a strange thing that if he if he is responsible for this, it wasn't because he's a rocket scientist. It's because everybody dropped the ball along the way, a lot. I mean, he got a pass for like from eighty six to ninety two, or even more than that. I mean, guys that did it, but they didn't do much all the way up until two thousand three. I, I don't want to badmouth the state police, but they dropped the ball, and I think they would tell probably tell you that. I mean, they just they had nowhere to go and. Just, just went on to other things. and The whole family seems to live under a lucky star. One brother was arrested for burglary, convicted, sentenced, but they couldn't put him in jail because there was no room, so they let him walk. Yeah. That same brother claimed he was locked up when this took place, and he wasn't. Now, why you would tell an investigator that, it's not like you can't find out. He insisted that he was locked up at the time. He wasn't. He got released, and he was out. Wow. Was he one of the family members who spoke about Richard and, and uh, the disappearance? He's one of the few that didn't. He's one of the ones that did not. He, he was caught speaking about it on, on more than one occasion by other people. Speaking about it as in, oh, my brother's, uh, you know, this girl my brother knew went missing, or speaking about it as in, like, oh, uh, we took her somewhere or something like that? Fairly incriminating statements. I mean, in statements that could be construed as being incriminating. General statements that could be construed as, you know. Another thing you're running into on, on this case, and others like it, is Greg was out there looking for photographs and records, local police records, and they'd been destroyed in a flood. Um, the whole police department was flooded, apparently. You know, I don't get that either. I just, yeah, that's it. So these guys, they've hit every break you can possibly imagine. So initially, no one, no one, no one even looks for it for months. Months. And then the, the investigation they do do is shit. It doesn't go anywhere, and they just keep passing paperwork back and forth for years. I mean, years. Nobody, nobody does shit. And then you know, I go down there and I'm at the sheriff's department, and I'm like, I just want to know what the I want to know what the background is. I'm going to get some information on these guys. No, nope, everything here got flooded. We don't have any of that stuff. God, geez, you guys are real. <laughs> you can't put stuff up on racks. Yeah, what are you yeah on seriously. The floor? You know. I, I feel like after a certain period of time, like like prior to uh, 1998, there was the the invention of shelves just didn't exist or like proper uh, like water sealing of your basement or wherever you store your records. Like I can't tell you the amount of times that we've heard the story that, you know, the records are lost because of a flood. Like take them out of the basement. It's amazing. And, you know, one of the guys I was talking to about it, and I won't, won't go into that, but he was a had to do with this, he said there were some really expensive weapons and stuff down there that was part of somebody's collection, and they were trying to save them. <laughs> like, I think I'd save the records first. Ugh. No, go, go for the weapons. Well, there's a reason for that, because if they were being stored for safekeeping and they got damaged, they were going to be on the hook for them. Yeah. So, you know, it's cover... Cover yourself financially, <laughs> I guess. But it's, it's not uncommon um, in smaller departments where they just didn't have the budget for proper storage. Yeah. If something yeah. happens, a flood or, or broken water pipes or something that 
and the records are gone. You know, it, that seems to be a, 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 just a really common and sad thing that police forces just are, are ill-equipped. They're, they don't have the funding they should have. You would think that we'd want to pay those people well and <laughs> help them do their job absolutely as much as possible. But it's, it just doesn't seem, you know, they're the first person that people get cut, I think. It just doesn't seem right. I haven't been involved in this case in, a, in years or anything, but I go down there and I talk to these people. I don't know people down there, and I'm ha- talking to people and interviewing people and stuff. And I'll say, tell me about this family or tell me about these guys. And they'll say, drinkers, druggers, wife beaters. Every time. Now, that's not me saying that. I don't know. I, I, I've i never met them face to face. I don't know. that, But this is what they tell me. This is from people in a, in a small town where, you know, a lot of people know know their neighbors everyone knows everybody oh yeah one lady said to me oh yeah i used to spend the night at their house i said well tell me a little bit about them violent drunks oh yeah did you have the opportunity to speak to richard's brother directly or are you just speaking from um hearing uh, through the grapevine no i've tried to i've tried to contact uh we had we had a we had a pi interview one because it's quite a distance away he 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 basically said, look, I, I wasn't living there at the time. I had moved away, and I all I know is hearsay. And we know that that's not true, too, because we, we have record of conversations that he had with people. So we know he's a liar. I asked to speak to the brother that lives in Vermont. I've spoke to his daughters. His daughters actually live near me. The, his daughters want nothing to do with him. They can't stand him. But they tried to hook me up with him, and it just didn't happen. I think he just doesn't want to talk to me. None of them want to answer the hard questions. Um, there was a TV or radio station, radio station that years ago that tried to get him to come in and answer some questions, and they wouldn't do it. And I don't think that they talk to the police if they don't absolutely have to. They get a lawyer, and they don't talk. Is there a bit of fear involved, do you think, when you're speaking with people and they're not answering the tough questions? I'm assuming what the tough question is, but do you think they take it to a certain point and then they realize any further that I go, this is only going to be bad for me and my family? Oh, absolutely. The only person that tries to hide a witness or or not be a witness is a person that, (laughs) you know, if you don't have anything to hide, why would you talk? Why would you talk? That's the way I look at it. I know that legal lawyers will tell you different, right, Lou? Basically, a lawyer will tell you don't you don't answer any questions at all, whether you're innocent or guilty or not. But human nature is if you don't have nothing to hide, you cooperate if you can. You know. Now there's another factor too. There's a fear factor involved also. I should tell you what the, I mean, and again, you know, I I'm just telling you what I've been told. But for instance, I've walked the streets of this town, and I've gone in the bars, and I've gone in the stores, and I've gone in the whatever, and I've hung up posters, and I've talked to people and stuff. Every person I've talked to said, yeah, he killed her, and she's buried on that property. What? Yeah. That's that's the, the rumor that goes around is that she she is on that family property, and she's been there. Is it still family property? It is. Um, it was a large property, which was uh, years ago was broken up and sold. So two-thirds of it was sold, but the main house and stuff is still the family property. When this one investigator got involved in 2003, he ended up searching the property. So he got a warrant. I don't know how he got the warrant. Which, pro- the, the Franelich property. He, see, he searched the Franelich property, yeah. So there was their farmhouse, but they ended up having, uh, was the father? The father had moved across the, the road like to another property. There was two like mobile homes there. I can't remember exactly. I think it was the father and his wife, and then he ended up mar- remarrying. His wife got cancer. He remarried. But um, Richard's aunt, Teresa, lived in the family property. She still lives there. But um, the state police went, and they searched outbuildings in the property. They didn't search the home, and I don't know how they got a warrant, but they did search. And they obviously had enough to get a warrant. Lou would be better one to ask about that. I don't know what, would, what would the requirements would be, but well, you, you certainly have to convince a judge or a magistrate that you, know, you had probable cause to believe that there was some type of evidence of the crime on the property. So you know, basically, that the affidavit should be public record unless it was impounded. But usually, if it's impounded, it's only impounded for a certain period of time. 
So if you knew which court it was taken out of, you should be able to get a copy of that. One thing I know is that some some information was given. So there was an uncle. So there's an aunt Teresa lives in the family home. There's an uncle they called Bank. His name is Mark, who lived just a distance away, and he ended up. Oh, when the property was, when the father passed away, he would left a piece of that property to, it was 102 acres. He left a piece of it to this bank, Mark. But Bill confirmed, he, he literally confirmed some information about the property. That may be where that affidavit got some ground, or that uh, warrant or whatever. Because he, he, he did confirm information. And, okay, but there was no, nothing found, obviously. No, they didn't find anything. But again, do you remember when we, uh, when I wrote that little thing for you, kind of about? I think it was about logical fallacies. Yeah, I wrote that laying in bed one night. I just kind of ripped it off. But one of the things that I kind of used as a template was just looking for something in the in a remote area or, or in the woods or whatever. It's how hard it is to find, especially after the passage of time. So I can't remember what year it was that they searched that property, but it was after two thousand and three. She had been missing since 86. So finding something on that property would be difficult, especially, and that's why I kind of told you in the beginning about the area of Schoharie being there's caves everywhere, there's springs, there's swamp, there's, and it's 102 acres. The, the property was altogether in, in 86, it's either 102 or 110. So it would be a process. They did bring the bugs out of the property. There was, there was two theories that I know of, and I, I heard them from PIs, and I heard them from people in the know. I heard them from town folk. I heard them from people sitting on bar stools. So, and it's always the same kind of thing. There was two theories. One was that she was on the property, obviously, and that she was in a well. And the other was that she was in a reservoir that was nearby. There was a search down of the reservoir, lasted a week. This I don't even know if Richard knows about this because he scooted. He didn't. He didn't. He doesn't want anything to do with this. He doesn't want to be asked. He doesn't want nothing to do with it. So he's just gone. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned dogs. Were there there were dog searches on the property? Do you know if there were dogs on the lake too, or the reservoir? I don't know. I don't know that. I, I just know that the that the search lasted about a week on the on the reservoir. Okay. Do you have any information about any? Um buildings or or any structures that were put up uh after her disappearance no the the farmhouse is just as it was years ago but the property behind it the 102 acres so the two pieces got sold off two-thirds of it you know kind of cut it in thirds and uh somebody built a really nice house on on one of the properties and uh the other one i think is vacant it may have a little shed on it but um the way the really nice house is that person granted permission for searches and people would go on and, and, and look around. But, you know, again, you know, you're looking for, an, you're looking for an artifact, you know, you're, you're, you're literally looking for things that would be there associated with her, not, not so much her. Cause she's, you know, she would probably be underground or something, but, and if she was, it's probably completely overgrown. It would be hard without someone to, to actually point it out to you, which is another whole story, but, um, yeah. So th- there had been someone on the property trying to point out an area. Is that what I gather from that one moment? I uh, yeah, I can't go into that. <laughs> okay. Is there possibly a chance to fly a drone over that area, or has that been done? People have walked it on foot. People have searched it. I mean, they they they, they, they and that whole family knew. I mean, they they knew. I mean, the the, the thing that he doesn't realize, I think, the, the husband Richard. I don't think he realizes how much his family talked. Um, and they didn't want to, I think they wanted to be loyal to him. And I didn't think that, I don't think that they wanted to blow him in. But when you asked, when, when they were asked, do you think he had something to do with it? Every one of them said, yeah. Well, I shouldn't say every one of them, all but two. So the family just kind of sat there while the searches were done and just climbed up and sat in the house and it was what it was kind of thing. And they, they did some pretty extensive searches, but they, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't have backhoes or anything like that because you, it's 102 acres. You know, you'd have to have a, you'd have to have some kind of a zone picked out. Yeah. That's a pretty big area. Yeah. And you're talking about, you're talking about, you know, woods and then hills and then swamp and 
it was known as, they referred to it as the holler, and they would all go down there and party. And if I took you there, prior to this house being built there, you, you, you would see that you could go in there and party for a week straight, the bonfire and music, do whatever you wanted, and no, you wouldn't bother anybody. No one would know. A neighbor might catch up eventually, but you're not going to bother anybody. Yeah, well, one of the stories, too, is that she was put down a, um, an ab- abandoned well, uh, which was then filled in with rocks. Is that correct, Greg? Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, when people think of wells, you think, like, you know, somebody comes in and drills a well and puts a cap on it and all that stuff. If you've seen them, I know I live in kind of a rural area. But that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about, you know, the German immigrants that settled that area in the late 1700s. And there's, you know, there's wells there. And they're basically just holes in the ground with a spring coming up out of it. And there's boards over it or whatever. And those boards eventually rot away and the grass grows around it. And you probably can't hardly even see it if you don't know it's there, you know. And cover something like that in wouldn't be difficult and stuff like that. So that, but that was a big rumor that went around. And much like in Brianna's case, and, and Lou and I talk about this a lot, is we can't believe how many people give false information. <laughs> this must drive the police bad shit. But they're so they, they're so convinced of what they're telling you is the truth. And some people even say, I was there, I was there. But they, there's no truth to it. We have a witness about to, for some information to do with the property. But there's no way of verifying it. So where does your investigation, your personal investigation in this stand currently? We're still doing interviews. We've got some good interviews coming up. It's, it's just constantly in motion. Um, we wanted to talk to him. He just, he claims, you know, I have nothing to do with this. And I said, well, you know, if you want to talk to us, I even offered, you know, you can come on the podcast. You can do whatever yeah. you want. You know, I said, you can ask me questions if you want. But he, he got pretty mad at me. The conversation went south pretty quick, and it was kind of my fault. But, uh, you know, I called him back, and I said, hey, I'm sorry. If, I don't know if you hung up on me or I lost you. But, you know, you want to ask me, and he said, nah, we're, we're done. Maybe he'll uh, change his mind and uh, after he hears this. I mean, obviously, if he is not guilty, that would make an incredible story. You know, we'd, we'd like to share that if, if that's the case. But uh, it, you're not painting a pretty picture for him here, and, and it's not your fault. I don't think you're going out of your way to do that. No. I, I think, to back to answer a question you asked a minute ago, um, where does it stand now? And like Greg said, there's, there's still more work to be done on it. Our goal when we started this um, was to get enough evidence to get the district attorney up there to reopen the case and to actively work it again. Yeah. So that's that's what we're hoping for because I think it's solvable. I really do. Well, that's the other thing, Lou. I, you know, I can't, I can't understand why there wasn't a grand jury. Again, the time passage, I think, is the main thing. It was nothing. It wasn't a hot case for seven years. Yeah. Well, to follow up on what Tim just said, if uh, Richard's out there and he hears this and he's thinking I'm innocent and these people are speaking ill of me and I want to clear my name or I want people to know what what I'm really all about, that's one thing. There's also, you know, so much time that has passed since her disappearance and, and her, you know, possible death. Maybe something in his uh, system, maybe something in his brain, maybe something in his heart has has uh, changed over the past few years. And maybe he would want to see some sort of justice or some sort of closure for, you know, somebody who he spent, a, a, you know, a, a chunk of his life with. And at, at some point, I'm assuming he cared about at some point, I'm assuming he cared about the children, too. And maybe the children would like to see something done uh, for their mother. Uh, in some in some form of justice, I think there's well, there's a few reasons he won't talk, but it doesn't look good for him. He was physically abusive. He'll deny that, but it's a fact. It's an absolute fact. It's a documented fact. He's arguing with her the night she disappears. I said, well, she's last seen on the you know the thirteenth. He said, well, I saw her after that. And it's funny because no one else did. You know, no, I, I, no one else comes forward and said, oh, yeah, she was eating over at our house, you know, that night. I mean, there's there's a 16, 17-day window there he's got to account for if he says he, he dropped her off at the uh, the bus station a few days before Halloween. Can't explain that. Rancid drug problem, heavy drinker, doesn't report her missing, doesn't look for her. You know, it just doesn't look good for him. So I don't know if he'll ever sit down and I, I, He doesn't want to answer the hard, you know, be asked the hard questions, I don't think. So, so Erica Franwick, Erica Paprosky, she becomes 
to me, the forgotten girl. You still can't find a lot on the internet about it. Just a couple little things here and there. There was a cop who really gave it his heart and soul and then retired and he's still interested in it and everything. But uh, after he retired in 2013, the family never heard from the police again. So I actually put the family back in touch with the police last year. They didn't really have an excuse as to why they hadn't contacted her. They're too busy. They're, they're busy. They're the police. They don't have time to work a 33-year-old missing persons case. They'll work it. I'm sure they'll work it if they have information, valid information comes in, they, they go work it. But So she, she, Erica becomes the forgotten girl.